Good afternoon and welcome to the October uh, session of our uh, AEI Bradley uh, lecture series. And let me begin, as I always do, by reminding you of next month's uh, lecture, uh, which will be on Tuesday, November 10th. Uh, Robert uh, Jastrow uh, will speak on God and the Astronomers. Our lecturer this afternoon is Samuel P. Huntington, who is uh, Eaton Professor of the Science of Government at Harvard University and is director of the John M. Olin Institute for Strategic Studies at Harvard's Center for uh, International Affairs. Professor Huntington has been a towering figure in American political science and especially in the study of military strategy, comparative politics, and political development uh, for several decades. I hope he doesn't mind my mentioning that he began teaching at uh, Harvard uh, over 40 years ago. I was uh, uh, speaking to a, a young uh, visitor from abroad at lunch uh, today, and I mentioned to her that I first encountered Professor Huntington when I was a freshman in college, uh, where I was assigned an already uh, highly reputed book, which was simply called Huntington and Brzezinski, their study of uh, politics in the USA and the USSR. Uh, and uh, I told her when that was, when I'd been a freshman, and she said, oh, he must be quite elderly by now. And I said, no, uh, not in the, uh, not in the uh, slightest. He's uh, younger in every respect I can think of than, uh, than I am. Uh, his uh, fields of study uh, particularly uh, qualify uh, him uh, to discuss uh, the subject uh, uh, of this evening's lecture, which I will leave for him to tell you more about, but which bears the title, The Clash of Civilizations. Uh, I also want, with a question mark, I also want to mention that uh, I'm sorry that uh, the, our, our uh, biography that we've passed out omitted <coughs> to mention the pinnacle of Professor Huntington's uh, scholarly career, which is that he is a member of the AEI Council of Academic uh, Advisors. Um, following the uh, uh, lecture, uh, uh, Professor Huntington will take questions. We will have our usual reception in the next room. Uh, and as there is a very different kind of uh, clash uh, that will begin on television at 7 p.m. this evening, I just want everyone to know that if you wish to stay, we will uh, run the uh, debate on the television monitors, and those who wish to uh, stay and watch them here, uh, would be, we would be glad uh, to have you. Uh, Samuel Huntington, please. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Chris. I am uh, flattered and uh, very delighted to, to be here, and I'm even more delighted uh, that uh, all of you are here. Uh, uh, the uh, Clash of uh, Civilizations uh, is certainly a poor runner-up to the Clash of Candidates. And uh, recognizing the priority of uh, the Clash of Candidates, I will uh, try to be relatively brief uh, in uh, my opening statement. Uh, which I believe is what it's called in a debate, isn't it? Uh, 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 and allow uh, plenty of time uh, for uh, at least some questions uh, before everybody uh, wants to head for uh, the TV sets. When President Bush rejected the vision thing, he created a vision vacuum. And he thus provided a great opportunity for social scientists who have rushed in uh, where the president feared to tread and have proliferated visions, models, and paradigms of the post-Cold War world. Uh, these include uh, Frank Fukuyama's uh, very imaginative uh, concept of the end of history, a rather conflicting model of, uh, of back to the future, uh, which involves intensi intensifying conflicts between nation states, and uh, a an image of the decline of the nation state by the conflicting pulls of tribalism or fra fragmentation on the one hand and globalism or interpenetration on the other. Each of these images, I think, uh, uh, catches aspects of uh, the emerging reality, uh, some more successfully than others. It is uh, thus with uh, some diffidence and hesitation that I add another picture uh, to this gallery. Yet I am convinced that these other visions uh, miss, in some respects, crucial and central aspects of what global politics will be like in the coming years. As Chris pointed out, the title of this lecture carries a question mark, uh, which I take seriously, and I hope you will too. 
I offer not a prediction, uh, but an hypothesis. The issue I wish to deal, is, deal with is, what will be the fundamental nature uh, and source of conflict in uh, this new world? My hypothesis is that it will not be primarily ideological or uh, primarily economic. Uh, the great divisions among humankind and the dominating source of conflict will be cultural. Nation states will remain the most powerful actors in world affairs, but the principal uh, uh, conflicts of global politics will occur between nations and, gr and, and groups of different civilizations. The clash of civilizations will dominate uh, global uh, politics. And let me say before I go any further that I don't think I'm entirely alone or original in setting forth uh, this proposition. Uh, Max Beloff, uh, my colleague uh, uh, Kishore Mabubani, Michael Lind, uh, William Lind, uh, Michael Vlahos uh, have all set forth somewhat similar arguments in somewhat uh, different words. Uh, they should not, however, uh, be held responsible uh, for my formulation of uh, this argument. Well, what do we mean when we talk of a civilization? A civilization is a cultural entity. Uh, villages, regions, ethnic groups, nationalities, religious groups, all have distinct cultures at different levels of cultural heterogeneity. The culture of a village in southern Italy may be different from that of a village in northern Italy, but both will share in a common Italian culture which distinguishes them from German villages. European communities, in turn, will share cultural features which distinguish them from Arab or Chinese communities. Arabs, Chinese, and Westerners, however, are not part of any uh, broader cultural entity. They constitute civilizations. And so I would define a civilization as the highest cultural grouping of people and the broadest level of cultural identity people have assured of the human race. Now, civilizations obviously may involve a large number of people, as is the case of China, or a very small number of people, as is the case with the Anglophone Caribbean. A civilization may include several nation states, as is the case with European, Latin American, and Arab civilizations, or only one, as is the case with Japan. Civilizations obviously blend and overlap. And at least one civilization, the West, has uh, two major variants, the European variant and the North American one. Civilizations are nonetheless meaningful entities, and while the lines between them are seldom sharp, uh, they are real. Civilizations are also dynamic. Uh, they rise and fall, they merge and divide, and as any student knows, they also uh, disappear. Now, civilization identity, I am arguing, uh, will be increasingly important in the future, and the world will be shaped in large me measure by the interactions among eight or nine major civilizations. And the most important conflicts of the future will occur along the cultural fault lines separating these civilizations uh, from one another. Now, why may this be the case? First, uh, differences among civilizations are not only real, they are basic. Civilizations are differentiated from each other by history, language, culture, tradition, and most importantly, religion. The people of different civilizations have different views on the relations between God and man, the individual and the group, the citizen and the state, uh, parents and children, husband and wife, as well as differing views of the relative importance of rights and responsibilities, liberty and authority, equality and hierarchy. These uh, differences uh, the, uh, are the product of centuries and they will not uh, disappear. And here, I guess I would dissent uh, from the very interesting lecture, Chris, uh, by, that, which you sent me by V.S. Naipaul, who talked uh, about our universal uh, civilization. When he said universal civilization, however, he meant Western civilization, and I am sure there are several billion people out there uh, who would dispute uh, the label he applies uh, to uh, Western civilization. Uh, second, uh, the world is becoming a smaller place. The interactions between peoples of different civilizations are increasing, uh, these, and these uh, increasing in, in, in interactions will, I believe, intensify civilization consciousness and awareness of differences between civilizations and commonalities within civilization. North African immigration to France generated hostility among Frenchmen, as well as at the same time a, an increased re receptivity to immigration 
uh, uh, by good European Catholic Poles. Americans react far more negatively uh, to Japanese investment here uh, than to the larger investments from Canada and European countries. The interactions among peoples of different civilizations uh, thus enhance the civilization and consciousness of people, which in turn reinvigorates traditional differences and animosities stretching back into history. Third factor, the processes of uh, economic modernization and social change uh, throughout the world are, separ are separating uh, people in some sense from their traditional identities. They also weaken the nation state as a source of identity. In almost every part of the world, religion has moved in to fill this gap, often in the, for in the form of movements which are labeled fundamentalist, and such movements are found in Western Christianity, Judaism, Orthodox Christianity, and Hinduism, as well as in Islam. The unsecularization of the world, George Weigel has remarked, is one of the dominant social facts in the late 20th century. And this revival of religion provides a basis for identity and commitment that transcends national boundaries and yet unites civilizations. Fourth, the growth of civilization consciousness is in some sense enhanced by the dual role of the West. On the one hand, uh, the West would appear to be at a peak of power. At the same time, however, and perhaps as a result, a return to the roots phenomenon is occurring among non-Western civilizations. Increasingly, one hears references to trends towards a turning inward and Asianization in Japan, the end of the Nehru legacy and the Hinduization of India, the failure of Western ideas of nationalism and socialism in the, uh, uh, in the Middle East, and hence the return to Islam, and now a debate over Westernization versus Russianization in Mr. Yeltsin's country. A West at the peak of its power thus confronts non-West that increasingly have the, the desire, the will, and the resources to shape the world in non-Western ways. Fifth, uh, cultural characteristics and differences are less mutable and hence less easily compromised and resolved than political and economic ones. In the former Soviet Union, communists can become Democrats, the rich can become poor, the poor and the poor rich, uh, but Russians cannot become Estonians and Azeris cannot become Armenians. In class and ideological conflicts, the key question was, which side are you on? And people could and did choose sides and change sides. In conflicts between civilizations, the question is, what are you? That is a given and it cannot be changed, and as we know from Bosnia to the Caucasus to the Sudan, uh, the wrong answer uh, can have deadly consequences. Finally, among the factors that seems to me uh, to be uh, leading uh, to an increased importance to civilizations, uh, there is in some cases an economic uh, factor which rein reinforces civilization consciousness and differences. Japan obviously constitutes not only a civilization, but also a formidable economic entity. Uh, the two variants of Western civilization are becoming economic entities. And in something which I don't think has uh, received a great deal of attention, there would seem to be uh, quite possibly an even uh, larger uh, in the long term economic entity uh, emerging in Eastern Asia uh, with China at its center as uh, the other Chinas in uh, uh, not just Hong Kong but Taiwan and Singapore increasingly become linked up uh, with uh, the home, co uh, home country and it seems to me we can look forward uh, to an economic, uh, a Chinese economic bloc as well as a possibly a Japanese economic bloc emerging in East Asia. But if this uh, conflict between civilizations uh, develops, it will, in my, in, I think, uh, uh, be the latest phase in the evolution of conflict in the modern world. And in some respects, perhaps also a return to pre-modern uh, patterns. Uh, for a century and a half uh, after the emergence of the modern international system with the Peace of Westphalia, uh, the conflicts of the Western world were largely among princes as emperors, absolute monarchs, and constitutional monarchs that attempted to expand their bureaucracies, uh, their armies, uh, their economic strength, and most importantly, the territory they ruled. In the process, they created nation states, 
and beginning with the French Revolution, the principal lines of conflict were between nations rather than princes. Uh, this 19th century pa pattern lasted until the end of World War I. At this point, as a result of the Russian Revolution and the reaction against it, the conflict of nations yielded to the conflict of ideologies. Uh, first between fascism and Nazism uh, on one side and liberal democracy, and then uh, in the second half of this century between Marxist-Leninism and liberal democracy. During the Cold War, uh, this latter conflict became embodied in the struggle between the two superpowers, neither of which was a nation state in the classical European sense, and each of which defined itself in terms of its ideology. These conflicts between princes, nation states, and even ideologies were, however, almost entirely conflicts within Western civilization. William Lind has called them Western civil wars. With the end of the Cold War, however, international politics moves out of its Western phase, and its centerpiece becomes the interaction between the West and non-Western civilizations, and among and non-Western civilizations. The Cold War began when the Iron Curtain uh, divided Europe politically and ideologically. It ended uh, with the end of the Iron Curtain. As the ideological division of Europe has disappeared, the cultural division of Europe between Western Christianity on the one hand and Orthodox Christianity and Islam on the other has reemerged. The most significant dividing line in Europe, William Wallace suggested a couple of years ago, may well be the eastern boundary of Western Christianity in the year 1500. This line runs along what are now the boundaries between Finland and Russia and between the Baltic states and Russia, cuts through Belarus uh, and the Ukraine, separating the Catholic Western Ukraine from the Orthodox Eastern Ukraine, swings westward, separating Transylvania from the rest of Romania, and then goes through Yugoslavia almost exactly along the line, now separating Croatia and Slovenia from the rest of Yugoslavia. In the Balkans, of course, uh, this line co corresponds with the historic boundary between Habsburg and Ottoman empires. The peoples to the north and west of the line are Protestant or Catholic. They shared the common experiences of European history, feudalism, the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the French Revolution, the Industrial Re Revolution. They are generally economically better off than the peoples to the east, and they may now look forward to increasing involvement in a, in a common European economy and the consolidation of democratic political systems. The peoples to the east and south of this line are Orthodox and Muslim. They historically belonged to the Tsarist or Ottoman empires, and were only lightly touched by the shaping events of the rest of Europe. They are generally less advanced economically. They seem much less likely to develop stable democratic political systems. In some sense, uh, one could say the velvet curtain of culture has replaced the iron curtain of ideology as the most significant dividing line in Europe. And obviously, as the events in Yugoslavia have shown, it is not only a line of difference, but also at times, a line of bloody conflict. Conflict along the fault line between uh, Western and Islamic civilizations has, of course, been going on in seesaw fashion uh, for, for 1,300 years, uh, first with the surge of Islam into Western Europe in the 8th century, uh, then the Crusades in the 11th and the 13th century, then the rise of the Ottoman Turks uh, from the 14th to the 16th uh, centuries, uh, 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 culminating in their siege of Vienna, and then, of course, in the, er in the 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, the reestablishment uh, by Britain and France of uh, uh, the establishment by Britain and France of Western control over mo most of North Africa and the Middle East. In this uh, seesaw uh, affair, uh, after World War II, uh, the West, in, in, in some respects, began to retreat. The colonial empires disappeared. Uh, first Arab nationalism and then Islamic fundamentalism manifested themselves. The West became heavily dependent on the Persian Gulf countries for its energy, and the oil-rich uh, Muslim countries became money-rich and when they wanted to uh, be weapons-rich. Uh, Several wars occurred uh, between the Arabs and Israel, which was, had been created by the West, British and French forces invaded Egypt in 1956. American forces invaded Lebanon in 1958. 
Uh, subsequently, American forces returned to Lebanon, attacked Libya, and engaged in various middle military encounters with Iran. Arab and Islamic terrorists, uh, supported by at least three Middle Eastern governments, bombed Western planes and installations and seized Western hostages. This intermittent struggle between the Arabs and the West culminated, of course, in 1990 when the United States sent a massive army uh, to the Gulf to defend some Arab countries against aggression by another. This action obviously divided the Arab world uh, between those governments allied with the U.S. and on the other side, portions of their own population and other governments uh, which opposed uh, the U.S. action. Saddam Hussein and anti-Western Muslims attempted to define the war as a war between civilizations. In a, uh, a famous tape uh, that was very widely uh, circulated in Saudi Arabia during uh, the, the war, uh, the Dean of Islamic Studies at uh, the religious university in Mecca said, and I quote, it is not the world against Iraq, it is the West against Islam. And of course, the outcome of this war left many Arabs feeling humiliated and resentful at the dependence of Arab countries on the West for their security and at the superiority of Western military power. This uh, century o centuries old military interaction between the West and Islam, it seems to me is unlikely to decline in the future. And uh, there are many reasons which I won't go into as to why it may become more virulent. And increasingly, uh, people on both sides of uh, this uh, divide are coming to see uh, this interaction as a cl clash of civilizations. I was interested uh, to uh, read a short while ago a statement by a leading Indian Muslim uh, author uh, who said, and I quote, uh, the West's next confrontation is definitely going to come from the Muslim world. It is in the sweep of the Islamic nations from the Maghreb to Pakistan that the struggle for a new world order will begin. And he is echoing uh, uh, words uh, which uh, Bernard Lewis uh, wrote a year or two ago in his essay on the roots of Muslim rage, where Lewis said, and I now quote him, we are facing a mood and a movement far transcending the level of issues and policies and the governments that pursue them. This is no less than a clash of civilizations the perhaps irrational but surely historic reaction of an ancient rival against our Judeo-Christian heritage, our secular present, and the worldwide expansion of both. Historically, the other great antagonistic interaction of Arab-Islamic civilization has been with the pagan, animist, and now, in and now increasingly Christian black peoples uh, to the south. In the past, this antagonism was epitomized in the image of Arab slave dealers and black slaves. It has recently been reflected in the ongoing uh, civil war in the Sudan between Arabs and blacks, the fighting in Chad, and the uh, recurring riots and communal violence between Muslims and Christians in Nigeria. The, the modernization of Africa, coupled with the rapid spread of Christianity, is likely to enhance the probabilities uh, for violence in the future along this fault line. On the northern border of Islam, conflict has increasingly erupted between Orthodox and Muslim peoples, including, obviously, the carnage of Bosnia and Sarajevo, the simmering violence between Albanian and Serb, the tenuous relations between the Bulgarians and their Turkish minority, the fighting between the Georgians on the one side and the Abkhazians and South Ossetians on the other, the unremitting slaughter of each other uh, by Armenians and Azeris, the tense relations between Russians and Muslims in Central Asia, and uh, the deployment of Russian troops to protect Russian interests in Azerbaijan and Tajikistan. In Central Asia, religion reinfor uh, uh, re reinforces the revival of ethnic identities and re-stimulates Russian fears about the security of their southern borders. Elsewhere in Asia, the conflict of civilizations also appears to be deeply rooted. The historic clash between Muslim and Hindu in the subcontinent manifests itself now, not only in the rivalry between Pakistan and India, but also in intensifying religions, religious strife within India 
between increasingly militant Hindu groups on the one hand and India's very substantial Muslim minority on the other. In East Asia, uh, China now seems uh, to be pursuing a, co a collision course with many, if not most, of its neighbors. With the Cold War over, uh, the underlying differences between China and the United States have reasserted themselves in areas uh, such as human rights, trade, and weapons pr uh, proliferation. In 1991, Deng Xiaoping re re reportedly asserted that a new Cold War, in his words, was underway between China and America. The same phrase has been applied to the increasingly difficult relations between Japan and the United States. Here, cultural differences exacerbate uh, economic conflict. People on each side allege racism on the other side. But at least on the American side, the antipathies, in my view, are not racial but cultural. The basic at values, attitudes, behavior patterns of the two societies could hardly be more different. The economic issues between the U.S. and Europe are no less serious than those between the U.S. and Japan, but they do not have the same political salience and emotional intensity because the differences uh, between American civilization and European civilization are so much less than those between American civilization and Japanese civilization. Clearly, the interactions between civilizations vary greatly in the extent to which they are likely to be characterized by violence. Economic uh, competition clearly predominates between the American and European sub-civilizations of the West and between both of them and Japan. On the Eurasian continent, however, the recent proliferation of ethnic conflict, epitomized at the extreme and ethnic cleansing, has not been totally random. It has been most frequent and most violent between groups belonging to different civilizations. In Eurasia, uh, one could say the great historic uh, fault lines between civilizations are once more catching fire. And this is particularly true along the boundaries of the Islamic Crescent uh, from the bulge of Africa uh, to Central a Asia. Muslims have also been involved in violent conflicts with Hindus in Kashmir, Buddhists in Burma, and Christians in the Philippines. Somehow, Islam apparently tends to have rather bloody borders. Reason thus exists to think that the major conflicts of the future will be between peoples from different civilizations. But what if a people is unsure to which civilization it does or should belong? This happens. Some countries and peoples are caught in between. They are what I would call torn countries. Most often, these, country, uh, these are countries whose, peoples, uh, whose leaders want their countries to be members of the West, but whose history, culture, and traditions are non-Western. The most obvious and prototypical torn country is Turkey. The late 20th leaders of Turkey have followed in the Ataturk tradition and defined Turkey as a modern, secular, Western nation state. They allied Turkey with the West in NATO and in the Gulf War. They applied for membership in the European community. At the same time, however, elements in Turkish society have supported an Islamic revival and have argued that Turkey is basically a Middle Eastern Muslim society. In addition, while the elite of Turkey has defined Turkey as a Western society, the elite of the West does not accept that definition. Uh, Turkey, it is clear, will not become a member of the European community. And the real reason, as President Ozal has said, and I'm quoting him now, is that we are Muslim and they are Christian, but they don't say that. Having rejected Me Mecca and then being rejected by Brussels, uh, where does Turkey look? Well, perhaps to Samarkand and a role as a leader of a Turkic civilization stretching from the borders of Greece uh, to those of China. During uh, uh, the uh, past decade, uh, Mexico has assumed a position somewhat similar to Turkey, it seems to me. Uh, Mexico has abandoned its historic uh, course of defining itself by its opposition uh, to the United States and instead is trying to imitate the U.S. and join uh, the U.S. in NAFTA. And the Mexican elite is involved in a variety of uh, fairly fundamental economic and, uh, reforms, which eventually will lead uh, to political reforms. 
A short while ago, I was engaged in a discussion with a top advisor to uh, per, uh, President Salinas, uh, who described at length all the changes the Salinas government was, uh, was making in Mexico. And when he finished, I remarked uh, uh, that that's most impressive. It seems to me that basically you want to change Mexico from a Latin American country into a North American country. And he looked up at me with surprise and said, yes, exactly. Uh, that's precisely what we're trying to do, but of course we can't say so publicly. Uh, that, it seems to me, is a remark which indicates the problems of a torn country. Globally, at present, of course, uh, the most important torn country is Russia. Uh, the question of whether Russia is a part of the West or a leader of a distinct uh, Slavic uh, Orthodox civilization has been a recurring one in Russian history. Uh, that issue and that debate was suppressed during the period of communist rule where the Russians imported a, a Western ideology, adapted it uh, to, uh, to uh, Russian conditions, and then used that ideology uh, to challenge the West. But with the end of communism, uh, this debate has now, of course, reopened very vigorously uh, within, within Russia. And I think it is fair to say it is rather unclear as to what the results of that debate uh, will be. It is perfectly possible uh, that having rejected uh, communism, uh, the Russians will now reject liberal democracy as well. And this could lead uh, to the emergence of a traditional authoritarian nationalist Russia, uh, which would have very different goals from either a Marxist Russia or a democratic Russia. Uh, and if, as the Russians stop behaving like uh, a Marxist, uh, and begin behaving like Russians, as a result, the gap between Russia and the West could widen. A Western Democrat uh, could carry on an intellectual debate of some sort at any rate uh, with a Soviet Marxist. It would be virtually impossible to do so, I think, uh, with a Russian traditionalist. Well, as I mentioned, the West has emerged as uh, in an extremely uh, powerful uh, position. And this, I think, is in the process of uh, bringing about a, uh, a reaction among the non-Western uh, societies. And the crucial uh, central uh, conflict in many respects, it seems to me, in the coming years uh, will uh, be between the West on the one hand and a, an Islamic Confucian uh, coalition uh, on the other. Uh, the action uh, the, of a, this uh, Islamic uh, Confucian uh, coalition, however, uh, is, I think, only symptomatic of a general reaction against the West on the part of non-Western uh, societies. As the West uh, uses its international inst the in international institutions it controls, its military power, and its economic uh, resources uh, to run the world in, w in ways that will maintain Western predominance, protect Western interests, and uh, promote uh, Western political uh, e uh, and economic uh, values. That is uh, the way, at least, in which the non-Westerners uh, see uh, this new world. And I think one has to concede that there is a certain amount of element of truth in this. I'm, in, I'm impressed with the extent to which Western leaders who used to talk about the free world when we were uh, in, in engaged in our conflict with the Soviet Union now talk about uh, the world community. It's sort of a legitimizing collective euphemism uh, to say we're acting on, the, uh, on behalf of a much larger group and to get, make us feel good about what we are doing. Uh, but uh, people on the other side don't necessarily uh, uh, see that, uh, see it that way. And hence, I think uh, a central ac axis of world politics uh, uh, will be in the, in the future, in uh, Kishore Mabubani's phrase, the conflict between the West and the rest. Now, this conflict has its roots uh, in Western power and in the feelings of envy, anger, hate, and attraction non-Western peoples have toward the West. Some non-Western groups, like the leaders of torn countries, uh, may at attempt to abandon their traditional values and culture and join the West. The leaders of other uh, societies may follow a course of isolation and attempt to insulate their civilization from penetration or corruption uh, by the West. More generally, however, non-Western civilizations are likely to attempt to compete with the West by developing their own economic, military, and political power. This conflict between uh, the Islamic uh, 
Confucian coalition and the West will, I think, uh, be most notable in the military area. It w has focused and probably will focus uh, largely, although not exclusi exclusively, on nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons, ballistic missiles, and other sophisticated means for delivering these weapons, and the guidance, intelligence, and other electronic capabilities uh, for achieving that goal. The West promotes non-proliferation as a universal norm and non-proliferation treaties and inspections as a means of realizing that norm. It also threatens a variety of sanctions against those who promote the spread of sophisticated weapons and proposes benefits uh, for those who do not. The non-Western nations, on the other hand, assert their right to acquire and to deploy whatever weapons they think necessary for their security. They have also absorbed to the full the response of the Indian Defense Minister when asked what lesson he learned from the Gulf War. And he said, don't fight the United States unless you have nuclear weapons. Non-Western governments view nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, missiles, uh, probably erroneously, as the potential equalizer of superior uh, Western conventional uh, power. A top Iranian official has declared that all Muslim states uh, should acquire uh, nuclear weapons. And a few years ago, the president of, Il of Iran reportedly issued a directive calling for the development of, quote, offensive and defensive chemical, biological, and radiological weapons. And it would appear uh, that North Korea, Iran, Iraq, Libya, Algeria are all involved in the effort to develop uh, nuclear we weapons. Centrally important. Uh, to the development of counter-West military capabilities is the sustained expansion of Chinese military power. And, and the, uh, the expansion of the means to create military power and uh, the expansion of its export of weapons and, and weapons technologies to Middle Eastern uh, uh, countries. It has done this in a variety of ways with a variety of uh, countries. And thus, I think one can say that a new form of arms competition is occurring between uh, the Islamic uh, Confucian Coalition and the West. In the old-fashioned arms race, each side developed th its own arms to balance or to achieve superiority in the competition with the other side. In this new form of arms co competition, one side is developing its arms, and the other side is attempting not to balance that arms uh, build up, but instead uh, to delay or prevent it. Well, in closing, let me just uh, first restate the main elements of my hypothesis and then spell out a couple of uh, policy implications or possible policy implications uh, for the leaders of Western civilization. I am not arguing that civilization identities will replace all other identities, that nation states will disappear, that each civilization will become a single coherent political actor or that groups within a civilization will not conflict and even fight with each other. I am instead setting forth the hypotheses that differences between civilizations are real and important, civilization consciousness is increasing, that conflict between civilizations will supplant ideological and other forms as con of conflict as the dominant global form, international relations historically again played out within Western civilization will increasingly be de-Westernized and become a game in which non-Western civilizations are actors and not simply objects. Conflicts between groups in different civilizations will be more frequent, more sustained, and more violent than conflicts between groups in the same civilization. Successful political, security, and economic international institutions will develop within civilizations, but with rare exceptions and not across civilizations. The paramount axis of world politics will be the relations between the West and the rest. And these relations will be highly conflictual, uh, focusing initially on the clash between the West and an Islamic Confucian coalition. Well, if these hypotheses should be borne out, what, what might be some of the implications for Western policy? These, I think, can be divided between short-term advantage and long-term accommodation. In the short term, it would appear to me that to be in the interest of the West to promote greater cooperation and unity within its own civilization, particularly between the European and North American components, to incorporate into the West societies in Eastern Europe and Latin America whose cultures are close to those of the West, 
to attempt to promote and maintain cooperative relations with Russia and Japan, to limit the expansion insofar as that is possible of the military strength of Confucian and Islamic states, to exploit the differences and conflicts among such states, and to support in other civilization groups sympathetic to Western values and interests. In the longer term, other measures uh, would be called for. Western civilization is both Western and modern. Non-Western civilizations have attempted to become modern without becoming Western. To date, only Japan has fully succeeded in this quest. Non-Western civilizations will continue to attempt to acquire the wealth, technology, skills, machines, and weapons that are part of being modern. They will also attempt to reconcile this modernity with their traditional culture and values. Their economic and military strength relative to the West will increase. The West, consequently, will increasingly have to accommodate to these non-Western modern civilizations whose power approaches that of the West, but whose values and interests differ significantly from those of the West. For the West, this will require a much more profound understanding of the basic religious and philosophical assumptions underlying these other civilizations and the ways in which people in those civilizations see their interests. It also will require a major effort to work out arrangements for Western coexistence with these civilizations based on the common needs of an increasingly interpenetrated modern global society. Thank you very much. Sure. Sure. Should I recognize him, or should you, or what? Okay. Yes, Jean. Extremely interesting presentation, and it is. It's been the more interesting thing is because I have long felt that in the party of the rule of the analogy, broadly, so many so decades. I'm catching up now. So, uh, so I'm especially interested in, uh, in this development. I have a question, though. I, it, is, it is on this matter of the reconciliation of modernity with non-Western yeah. culture. Yeah. Um, and I think, for example, I've been working on, on a couple of your uh, other colleagues, and I get in touch with the case back to the Angels and Smith. Yes, and yes. Western. Yes. Right. That's, yes. 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 No, that's 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 it exactly. Uh, you. Right on target. As usual. Yes. conflict between modernity and well, I'm sorry, you mentioned West a uh, country that modernized and westernized and First of all, I, th I think uh, you can make the argument that uh, in, at some phases in modernization, secular, uh, something like sec well, that can be called secularization occurs. But it seems to me, if you look around the world today, uh, the whole world is uh, back in the, in the midst of a religious revival of one sort or another. Uh, and this is uh, true in the West as, uh, as well as elsewhere. Uh, uh, 
uh, one uh, uh, a French writer about this, uh, Gilles uh, Capel, has called this God's revenge. Uh, uh, he's getting back. Uh, we're all everybody's coming back to religion uh, now. So, I, and uh, I don't I don't necessarily think that in any other way this necessarily means a retreat from modernity. Now, it may cause problems, and if you take uh, uh, Islam, uh, some of the tenets of uh, uh, that are uh, purportedly a part of Islam very seriously, and obviously it makes some uh, creates some difficulties in running in a modern economy or a, mo or a modern society. Uh, but uh, uh, it seems to me the important thing is uh, that people are taking uh, uh, those uh, religious tenets uh, uh, seriously. Uh, and, and they will have to obviously uh, strike a, uh, a, uh, 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 some compromises uh, between uh, uh, they are uh, uh, between the one and the other, uh, but that, it seems to me, does not necessarily mean uh, that they're going to be westernized. They'll be modernized in, uh, in Islamic or Hindu or uh, uh, Chinese sort of uh, Confucian sort of way. Yes. Isn't what you're talking about really the failure of modernization? In other words, the the, the growth of religious fanaticism has taken place that have tried to modernize and either have failed to do so or have been beset by uh, economic turbulence and depression. Uh, you don't see religious fanaticism in Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, you see it in a place like uh, uh, Iran or uh, some of the North African countries, which have been touched by the West, but which have not really absorbed the values of the West to the degree that the, some of the East Asian countries have. Well, first of all, I'm not sure that the East Asian countries really have absorbed the values of the West uh, uh, to all that much. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, I, if you take the, the uh, I guess it's about the eighth or ninth wealthiest country in the world, uh, Singapore, uh, it is an extraordinarily successful modern society, uh, but uh, uh, its uh, leader, founder and leader, uh, very consciously uh, refuses to define it as a Western society and has made every effort uh, to uh, maintain a C Confucian caste uh, to uh, the uh, values, education uh, uh, in Singapore, uh, of Singapore, and uh, it seems to me it is uh, possibly another case uh, where, a, uh, in addition to Japan, where you will have a non-Western uh, society uh, that has uh, quite successfully modernized uh, but uh, maintained uh, its uh, in, in central elements of its uh, uh, traditional culture. Yeah. second part, which uh, talks about the need for profound understanding of the other side. And I've never quite I only understood. did that in my last sentence. <laughs> no, it was the penultimate one, I think. All right. Uh, and it, um, I've never understood quite how profound understanding of the other side will avoid the conflict that's laid out in the fore part of the talk. Uh, do you have some reasonable confidence that the kinds of clashes that seem to be emerging uh, will, as uh, we understand things better, uh, gradually be reduced? No, I don't have much confidence that they will be. Uh, but it's, it seems to me uh, that uh, uh, it is uh, the beginning of wisdom uh, for uh, people in our civilization or people in any uh, civilization to try to understand uh, the uh, uh, motives and basic uh, philosophical assumptions and beliefs of uh, the people they're uh, dealing with. Uh, at the beginning of the uh, Cold War, after all, in the 1940s and 1950s, uh, we made tremendous uh, efforts, uh, both in our government and in our universities and elsewhere, uh, to uh, study the Soviet Union and try to find out uh, what sort of a beast uh, we, uh, this was that we were uh, uh, dealing with and the operational code of the Politburo and all this vast literature and the Russian and Soviet uh, uh, studies uh, programs and institutes and so forth. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, we ought to uh, 
uh, do something similar as we interact uh, with uh, other uh, 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 with, with other uh, civilizations. Uh, just to cite uh, cite one example, uh, at my institute at uh, Harvard, we have uh, a work going on. Uh, trying to look at the strategic cultures of uh, non-Western civilizations, with people studying Chinese strategic culture, Indian strategic culture, Arab uh, strategic culture, and so forth. And it seems to me there's a real issue here, is uh, to what extent do people in these other civilizations think about uh, international affairs, uh, 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 the nature of uh, foreign policy, uh, uh, strategy, and conflict in the same way uh, that we do? Now, obviously, in some respects, they do. Uh, but it seems to me you can also uh, make the argument that in perhaps in, in important uh, respects they don't. Uh, my uh, colleague uh, uh, Stephen Rosen uh, likes to uh, make the point uh, that deterrence, which worked very well dealing with the Soviets, who after all were uh, fairly rational uh, 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 people uh, uh, concerned with the uh, uh, calculating the uh, uh, correlation of forces, uh, and so forth and so on, and acting in terms of uh, materialistic balances of uh, military power, uh, deterrence worked pretty well with them, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the same sort of uh, deterrence uh, policies are going to work uh, with people of uh, different uh, uh, cultures. And he argues uh, that the t look at the record of deterrence uh, from uh, 1941 on down uh, to 1990, I guess, and the Gulf, uh, it hasn't been all that good. Uh, and that what I'm saying is that it seems to me if we're going to deal with these people, whether it's uh, uh, in a cooperative or a conflictual uh, a way, we should uh, try to uh, expand our understanding of their ways of thought. Then on, on a practical yes. level, when you think about the policy implications of your analysis, I think we're kind of caught in a dilemma if, on the, on the one hand, you say that nuclear, chemical, bacteria, seems to sort of cut for a even more dramatic kind of regime of export controls than we've had before. On the other hand, if, if we really want to reach to a Japanese-type civilization, that means bringing them rapidly into technology diffusion, modernization, sharing everything. Yeah. If, so it, it, uh, looking at kind of the diffusion of technology and export control regimes, how... Uh, how deeply, how, how much can we really have a regime which develops and diffuses and westernizes and modernizes and one that really sits on the kind of technologies that could feed some of these dramatic uh, potential conflicts? Well, I guess uh, in terms of uh, export uh, controls, uh, it seems to me, uh, by and large, uh, any control of that type can uh, delay or postpone uh, uh, weapons uh, developments in other societies. I'd be very uh, surprised if it, uh, if it was uh, uh, able to prevent it uh, for any uh, very considerable length of, uh, of time. Uh, the one clear case we have of where a uh, country has been prevented from developing uh, nuclear uh, weapons is Iraq. Uh, and it was attacked militarily twice, uh, by the first by the Israelis uh, 10 years ago, and then by us uh, in an effort to, uh, to do this. Uh, and I think if we're really going to be serious about preventing other countries from becoming, uh, uh, developing a nuclear capability, it, it will probably re require some sort of action like that. And I don't think uh, we can, or in most cases, probably we should. Uh, take that sort of preemptive, or attempt to take that sort of preemptive action. So I think the uh, growth of uh, non-Western uh, military power is just going to occur. And particularly now, of course, with uh, uh, all the incentives uh, uh, that uh, at the moment the uh, former Soviet republics have to uh, sell weapons and technology. Yeah, Ben? global popular culture and our I think a general conclusion was that uh, for good or for ill uh, American popular culture w was literally swamping the world that mm -hmm. there was a incredible wave of Americanization going on uh, I, I wonder um, a, a, particularly among young people all over the world not, not just in the in, in the in the Western countries uh, and uh, 
looked at television and movies and music and language uh, and the, the how, how that carries ideas like markets and democracy. And, and I wonder uh, how, how important you think that um, uh, electronic warfare mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think you're absolutely right, uh, clearly, uh, uh, on the spread of American popular culture around the world. And uh, it strikes me that uh, is a rather curious, there's a rather a curious reversal uh, of roles taking place. As, as uh, uh, non-Western societies uh, encountered uh, the West in the past, uh, historically, uh, uh, it was the elites of those societies uh, which uh, uh, absorbed Western values, went off to LSE or the Sorbonne, uh, military elites uh, learned from the, uh, from, from the West and so forth and so on. And uh, the, uh, uh, it was the popular groups uh, that uh, resisted, uh, re remained uh, attached to uh, tradition, uh, traditional values and ways of belief and behavior patterns and so forth and so on. And this, uh, is sort of the classic dichotomy you see reflected in, uh, reflected in all the literature on uh, uh, modernization and political development and so forth. Now it strikes me uh, that you have, in, in, a, in a sense, almost a reversal. And as you point out, uh, uh, popular culture is, as a result of all these electronic developments, uh, is um, American popular culture in particular, uh, is uh, spreading around the world. I don't know what the impact of that and effects of that will be in terms uh, of uh, politics and economics, but it, that is clearly a fact. And yet at the same time, it is among, uh, as, as I uh, uh, see it, uh, in many cases, the elites in these non-Western societies who are reacting against the West. Uh, and certainly in the, uh, in the Middle East, uh, uh, in uh, talk to uh, I was, uh, uh, people in uh, one Arab country after another, and I was at a conference on the uh, challenge uh, uh, of democratization in the Arab world just a couple of weeks ago in, in Cairo, and, uh, and one person after another said the uh, people who are really uh, the heart, at the heart of the Islamic fundamentalist movements are younger yuppie types. Uh, uh, the uh, merging technocrats, uh, first generation college uh, graduates, and so forth and so on. And they are the ones who are, are providing the fire and the intellectual leadership and the drive uh, in uh, the Islamic uh, uh, movements. Uh, precisely the people who, uh, or more or less precisely the people who at an earlier point uh, uh, would have been uh, sympathetic to the West. So it seems to me you've had sort of a peculiar re reversal of, uh, of uh, roles here between elite and mass and, some, and at least uh, some society. Yeah, Frank? Conflating two very different phenomena when you mix uh, oh probably <laughs> when you mix uh, you know Islam with Confucian society and talk about some kind of a coalition and it seems to me that you know there really is a basic problem in uh, a fundamentalist uh, Islamic society you know, producing modern natural science or coexisting with modern natural science which is somehow you know necessary for the creation of our modern you know, economic world and so you know in the short run they're they're very blessed because they're sitting on a lot of oil. They can't create a you know one megabit DRAM chip, but they can turn on a spigot and, and yeah. watch the money pile up in a bank account, and then they can buy the technology. But in the long run, that's not you know the civilization. It seems to me that is really uh, at all going to be compatible with, with economic modernity. The real challenge, it does seem to me, lies in countries like Japan and, and others in Asia, where it's not just that it turns out that their traditional cultures are compatible with economic modernity, but there's some evidence that they're more compatible, or that you know they you know, what survives from a traditional culture is actually better at producing, you know, a high level of a technological society than ours. But if you look at Asia, you know, the trends, it just seems to me, are very, very contradictory. I mean, there is, you know, as you cited, uh, this, uh, you know, growing Asian consciousness. On the other hand, you know, modernization theory, in a way, has worked better in Asia than in any other part of the world. That, uh, you know, the political democratization, uh, Western-style individualism has been proceeding in lockstep uh, with, economic modernization, so that the most you know, economically advanced countries are the most you know, Western in that sense. If you look at Thailand, the people that were supporting the pro-democracy movement there are precisely those yuppie, you know, the young kind of professional yuppie classes that have been uh, you know, thrown up as a result of Thailand's rapid economic modernization. The same thing goes in China. 
and in many ways, you know, in, in, I mean, in the end, it seems to me that you are uh, underestimating the kind of universalistic you know, characteristics of Western civilization that make it not just the outgrowth of a particular, you know, peculiar European cultural religious system, but you know, kind of you know, universal fit between aspects of that civilization and you know, kind of broader human civilization and you know, societies dealing with uh, you know, the problems of a, a workable, you know, technologically modern uh, society. Well, you know, I, I, as I said, I think the, the points you, uh, you, you uh, made are uh, plausible. Um, and in some respects, even valid. Uh, 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 and obviously, our civilizations are going to work out uh, uh, their uh, own compromises. I guess I'm a little bit hesitant, however, about making uh, 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 predictions about what cultures uh, permit or encourage or don't permit or encourage. I mean, uh, you say that Islamic culture, you can't have uh, uh, economic, real economic modernization. Well, uh, 30, uh, 25 years ago and before that, uh, 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 people, including Max Weber, were saying the same thing about Confucian society cultures. They could never modernize. Uh, now we're saying that they have modernized because they are Confucian. Uh, uh, and I just, uh, uh, as I say, I'm a little bit suspicious about uh, uh, predictions uh, that uh, uh, some cultures are inherently incapable of, uh, of uh, going along with modernization. And when modernization occurs, obviously this will involve not only uh, bringing in uh, some of the uh, uh, of the uh, 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 techniques and uh, um, uh, industrial uh, uh, skills of the West, but uh, sure there'll be some rub off of uh, Western values too, and uh, the result will be uh, a, a, a some sort of a mix. Um, that, but that's one set of issues. Uh, and that is, you know, what does the final product as uh, China, let us say, uh, um, uh, modernizes, as it is obviously doing economically extremely rapidly, uh, what will be the nature of, uh, of uh, the mix that comes out at the end? Uh, that's one issue. Uh, the second issue is uh, how uh, will uh, this entity, uh, this much more powerful economic and military entity, uh, relate to the West and other civilizations? Uh, I mean, I would, if I had to predict uh, what in the long run was going to be uh, the great conflict of the mid-21st uh, century, uh, it would be a, 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 a replay of uh, the conflict between China and Japan uh, with the outcome being rather different than it was before. Uh, yes, Mike. I've always thought of our own society, the United States, as being a fairly religious society except the elites, but I don't in general see Western society becoming more religious, so I wanted to ask you if you thought that was the case in, in our own civilization. You mean in Europe? Um, the West in general, North America. Well, but you've already conceded that the United States is fairly religious. But I, uh, my question has to do with the direction. Uh -huh. Are we becoming more religious like other civilizations. Well, I think that certainly it's been a religious revival in this country, and there's been uh, a renewed religious fundamentalism in uh, this country. Uh, uh, now, I don't know how long it will continue, uh, and I wouldn't want to try to predict uh, what may happen in uh, uh, it may happen in Europe, except that insofar as Europeans uh, uh, begin to feel as they appear to be uh, beginning to feel uh, increasingly threatened uh, by uh, people coming from outside Europe uh, and surging over uh, their borders. Uh, I, one reaction to, to that certainly uh, could be uh, a one which would involve uh, some sort of uh, uh, religious fundamentalism in the part of uh, uh, Protestants and or Catholics in Western Europe. I'm not saying that will happen, it just could happen. Sure, okay, you said you had two questions, yeah. The second one has to do with um, the, the rise of multiculturalism and that emphasis in the United States. Yeah. And I guess I, I yeah. want to know, is that for real, or is it that those that the values of um, pluralism, diversity, tolerance, are really just Western values, so that multiculturalism is sort of the West in sheep's clothing? Well, I don't know if I'd exactly view it uh, that way. Uh, it, it seems to me uh, one... Uh, could raise the issue, which I think is raised by multiculturalism, of the de-westernization of the United States. 
Uh, and uh, that, it seems to me, is a trend that is uh, happening in uh, some respects. Uh, uh, and uh, it, that is something which we're going to uh, have to live with in this society. Uh, and I guess it, it, it strikes me that uh, insofar as uh, the United States uh, increasingly becomes uh, uh, more heterogeneous uh, uh, with uh, a l larger and larger uh, proportions of the populations uh, 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 looking uh, uh, at ancestral homes in either uh, uh, Latin America or in Asia, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, this will uh, raise uh, once again, a recurring issue in, in American history of uh, uh, what is the uh, nature of the United States, uh, what is the basis of American uh, unity. Uh, and originally, uh, it seems to me, it was uh, uh, a compound of two things. Uh, one was a, uh, the uh, Western, uh, a really British, uh, Anglo-Saxon uh, inheritance uh, on the one hand, and then a set of uh, political uh, values, ideals, and principles on the other. Uh, and if, as the uh, first uh, fades from the scene, as it uh, apparently will do, it seems to me it, uh, the, the second uh, becomes all the more important. And insofar as multiculturalism challenges, uh, it appears to me it does in many respects, uh, the basic uh, principles and values of, uh, uh, of what has been uh, the American creed, uh, that could be a, a very, very uh, real threat. And the United States is really the only, con I think, probably uh, uh, the only country left in the world that defines its uh, identity in terms of a political philosophy. Uh, and uh, uh, it would be uh, uh, ruinous to this country if, uh, if uh, uh, the consensus on that uh, uh, political philosophy uh, was undermined. One more. Uh, yes, I guess Owen Harry's. We'll go by seniority, even though Michael had his hand up too. Uh -huh. uh, it seems to me that there are two uh, different forms of your thesis that one could get from what you said. One is a sort of revolutionary one. The other is much more modest. In, in the revolutionary form, uh, which I took you to be advancing for most of the talk, it is that essentially a conflict between civilizations is going to replace the traditional conflicts of, of international affairs, well, uh, conflicts uh, between states. Yeah. Uh, in your recapitulation, you went back, uh, took several steps back from that, it seemed to me, and uh, went out of your way to emphasize that, of course, um, conflicts between states would still occur. Um, there's, it's very important to know which is being discussed, I think. Is it the case of this uh, new one supplanting old, the old, or is it the case that uh, conflict between civilizations would, will, from now on, in your opinion, provide the dynamic for conflicts between states, that they will continue to be, as they were in the age of ideology, the, the instrumentalities or the vessels by which uh, the conflict between civilizations will play themselves out. Mm -hmm. well, let me, let me see, see if I can make my uh, position clear, which uh, I may not be able to do, but I'll try. Um, first of all, nation states are clearly going to uh, remain. They're going to uh, be around for, for a while. Secondly, I would, ar I would argue, as I think I did argue, uh, that uh, the uh, conflict between civilizations will become uh, the dominant form of conflict, uh, replacing that of ideologies or nation, or, or nation states as in the 19th how they, century. How they play themselves out? Through what Pardon me? Through what institutions will well, these what? conflicts play themselves out? Won't they have to Between be, uh, civilizations? Yeah. Well, I mean, they'll play themselves out and militarily. I mean, the actors will, be in, will in most cases be nation states. Uh, but they will be nation states of different civilizations. After all, most of the wars with which uh, uh, international, uh, in international politics, uh, with which international politics has been concerned, have been conflicts between West, uh, Western European states, really. And what I'm saying is now it'll be conflicts between civilizations, uh, where conflicts between, uh, occur between ethnic groups or 
nation states will normally be between, uh, between uh, 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 groups in different civilizations. Now, I have a, I have a, uh, um, a, uh, uh, a little test uh, w uh, which uh, I, I can uh, uh, put forth here as a proposition. I've gotten into arguments about with people during the past year or so uh, who have been predicting that there's going to be this great war, even perhaps a nuclear war between the Ukraine and uh, between Ukraine and Russia. And I have, uh, on the basis of my assumptions about civilizations, I sort of poo-pooed it and said, well, you know, there's uh, too much in common, and uh, uh, they really uh, basically uh, in uh, largely uh, part of the same civilization and so forth and so on. Uh, and people were predicting, uh, you know, they'll be fighting in the Black Sea, uh, uh, paratroopers landing in Crimea, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, we'll see. Uh, but uh, that would be a test. Uh, Russians have more in common than, say, the Germans and the French had in 1914? Well, that's, I don't think that's the relevant question, because the, we've, the, the, uh, the level of conflict has escalated up. And in, and in, and in 1914, the, the French and the Germans only had each other to fight. Uh, whereas now, uh, there are uh, all these other peoples out there uh, to uh, uh, fight. Well, thank you. Thank you.